Hi, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if this is the first time you're here, welcome. Uh, we're really glad to have you here. And let me show you around a little bit to make sure you know where, where things are. Um, uh, so we've got, uh, you're, a, you're probably an attendee if this is the first time you're here. Um, there's attendees and panelists. Uh, and the panelists got here early. So that's, that's the big uh, thing that separated them from the rest. Uh, and so they had good internet, good audio, good video, and they showed up early. We opened the doors at 6 a.m. Uh, you don't have to be here at 6 to get on the panel, but you have to be here by 6.40. But, but, you, but we do open the doors at 6 and start talking about whatever we feel like talking about. It's usually a wide-ranging, uh, very easygoing conversation at 6 a.m. Uh, with about 100 people. <laughs> it, it keeps on getting bigger. The 6 a.m. crew keeps on getting larger and larger. Uh, and so it's just kind of an open chat uh, between 6 and 6.30. At 6.30, we distribute the Discord link. Discord is, if you're not familiar with it, is a Slack-like uh, community. Uh, there's about 400 of us in there because talking about this stuff for three hours a day wasn't enough. So we opened up something that we could keep on chatting. So Discord is available. We, we released the Discord link at 6.30. At 7 o'clock, it's invalid. So you have to be here at 6.30 to uh, get the Discord link. Um, so come in, come in early if, you, if you'd like to uh, join that discussion. At 6.40, we start doing mic checks. So between 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, we do mic checks. Once we start doing mic checks, uh, there's, we're not adding anybody to the panel. But if you want to, join the panel, be here before 6.40, and raise your Zoom hand. So the little blue hand that you want to raise hand. And once you do that, we'll bring you in and give you and uh, see if you look good and sound uh, good enough to, to stay here. Usually people do a pretty good job. So um, we start the, the, the formalities uh, at 7 o'clock, which is what we're starting right now. From 7 to 8 is Q&A. So any questions that you have, you can use the question and answer system at the bottom. Uh, one request on the question and answer system, only one question uh, per post. Uh, so don't don't ask a, a bunch of complicated questions. It's too hard for us to kind of read through. Uh, and uh, and then also keep your questions to less than five lines. If you put comments in, if you have multiple questions, or if you have long, uh, long questions, we'll most likely just dismiss it or ignore it until the very end, uh, just because we're trying to move through a lot of questions at one time. If you're a panelist, you need to ask those questions before you become a panelist uh, while you're still an attendee because panelists can't ask those. So make sure to do that before you uh, join the panel. Uh, we will always prioritize the questions in the Q&A system uh, before we start taking questions from the panelists. And in most most weekdays, we will not make it to the panel. <laughs> so so the, uh, the, the, the questions in the Q&A usually keep us pretty busy. Uh, if you want to keep on chatting, you don't have a question, you can use the chat function. So use the chat there. J if you ask questions there, just know that we're not going to uh, probably address them in the conversation. But of course, you can talk amongst yourselves uh, the whole time. So, so that, that's what the, the, the chat is there for. Um, we've got uh, the second hour of each day, uh, that's the 8 to 9 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, is uh, what we call second hour. And it's usually where we find one subject that we want to talk about. So uh, this week, for instance, we're doing ruthless reviews at, um, today. Every Monday, we do ruthless reviews. We're going to go through everybody's video setup and talk about what, what's working and not working about their setup. It's still pretty fast because there's 40 people in it. So it's about a minute, minute and a half for each person. Um, but we're going to go through that. So that's that's Monday's. Tuesday, we're going to talk about mic placement. So all of us together, we've got some great audio engineers and educators that are in this group. And we're going to um, have a discussion about mics and mics pla mic placement in many, many different backgrounds. So that's the second hour. Chris Summer is going to lead a um, discussion on Wednesday about optics. So really thinking about all the considerations, the optical considerations before light hits your sensor on your on your camera. So we're going to talk about that on Wednesday. On Thursday, Nick Justin is going to talk about trading cards. Um, now these are he he basically did mass production of trading cards for like little leagues and everything else years ago, and he's going to talk about what that. Um, what that looks like and, and how he did it. And it's really talking about automation and talking about processing. And so I think it's going to be a really interesting um, discussion uh, in that set. We have a, and we also have a bonus on Thursdays where Oliver Breidenbach is going to talk about um, showing us tips and tricks in, uh, in Memo Live. So, uh, so those are the, that's the third hour on Thursdays that we're testing. And then Friday we have Wirecast. We're going to talk about Wirecast. Jeffrey Powers is going to talk about um, Wirecast and uh, and how he uses it and and and, and what what advantages he sees uh, with Wirecast. So we're going to talk about that on Friday in the second hour. Then Saturday we have the long the long day, which is what we call it. Uh, it's about seven hours of of chit chat. Uh, we start with two hours of of Q and A, and then at nine o'clock Nick Justishin is going to talk about. 
uh, Unreal Engine and answer your questions. Deep Cuts with Steve Bays, former senior by, uh, former senior product manager for Final Cut, uh, is going to talk about deep cuts in Final Cut and how to use them. Alex Goldner, Alex Forty Goldner, is going to talk about building templates in motion for broadcast. And uh, at eleven, and then at noon. Aaron Mailer will answer your networking questions. And so Saturday turn, turns into a very long but rewarding day as far as education goes. And um, anyway, so that's that's what we have planned in front of us. And without further ado, uh, Phil, do you want to, could you do questions for us today? Chris is not available. I didn't hear you there, Phil. How many do you see in the Q&A today? Is there 13? Uh, I see 13. Okay, just want to make sure I see them all. All right. <clears throat> and one note, one note, as we get started with the questions, uh, use the use the voting. Use the use the vote up. If there's questions there at 13, we're, we may get to a couple more, but I don't know how many more than 13 we'll get to in this hour. So take those questions and start to vote them up, the ones that you're most interested in, and we'll get to those first. Anyway, go ahead. Great. So can you please, from uh, Michael Tucker, Tucker asking, uh, explain some of the uses for SRT? So I, so I think that we, 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 the first thing we have to do every time someone asks about SRT is to separate, there are two SRTs in our world and they are not the same at all. So one is SRT, which is secure, reliable transport. Um, that was something that, that, that has been created as an open source project for, from high vision um, that moves video um, uh, around. And then sub, the, the other SRT as, as A. Mitchell's pointed out is subrip text. Um, and subrip text is used for subtitling uh, I think it was primarily created by YouTube or for YouTube um, to put up, um, you know, sub subtitles. And so we're going to talk about, well, that's what they, that's what they both do. So it's a little bit more, but what we're going to talk about the uses of SRT as a video transport is a secure, reliable transport. It's basically one of the problems that we have, and I'll let other people raise their hand if they want to add to what I'm saying. But one of the problems that we have is getting our video, we turn it in, we turn, we take it from a video signal and turn it into bits. And in those bits, we have to get it somewhere else in the world, you know, across the public internet. And one of the challenges that we have is getting all the bits <laughs> to the other part of the world. And you'll see that when you see buffering, when you see, you see frame loss, you know, all kinds of other things that you see, that's bits not getting to where all the bits getting to you or getting to what we call the ingest point. Um, so there's a lot of different protocols to try to figure that out. RTMP does some of that. Um, but I'm more, and then there's, you know, um, uh, FEC, which is forward error correction, which is another uh, thing that we, we use for that. And then there's Zixi, which is probably in, in many ways currently the, 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 uh, uh, the industry standard for absolutely going over a public internet and getting from one side to the other. But the one that's moving up very fast is SRT. So SRT um, is, was, again, created, I believe, by High Vision, um, and, and, but, but made available to everyone um, to, to build on. And SRT is designed to reliably get all the bits from one side to the other um, in as low latency as possible. Um, it's not as low latency as something we're seeing right now, um, but it is lower latency and, uh, and it tends to be very reliable. Um, go ahead, Leland. Just not to confuse with SRT.com, that's a phone system. You just want to ignore that website altogether. <laughs> so that's not what we're speaking on here. But yeah, High Vision put that together. It's more of a reliable transport for areas where you have uh, really tough locations that you're trying to get a signal to, and you have to slow it down a little bit to avoid all the packet loss. So you're basically pushing the signal a little bit slower than normal just so that it can you know, flatten out on the other. And anyway, that's so that's that hopefully explains some of and SRT is being used in a lot of places as a contribution for, you know, one of the things people can use it for, for instance, is SRT going into, let's say, vMix in the cloud, you can, you know, or vMix somewhere, but you can basically pass the using SRT, get a lot of this stuff into the cloud and then be able to, um, you know, uh, cut with it. And uh, it's a pretty reliable are, way to are get Are you that using done. it? Is it ready for Alex's prime time? I am not currently using SRT. Um, you know, I am looking at it and I'm testing it, um, but you know, most of the backhauls that I use are Zixi based. Um, and so, and I've been using Zixi for a long time. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a warm blanket for me as far as knowing that I'm gonna get something from one side to the other. Um, and so I tend to move a lot slower than a lot of folks here. So uh, I, I'm not saying that I'm not going to use SRT and I, and I'm con I plan to continue to test it, um, but, I'm, but I, I'm not ready to, get rid of what I'm, the pipelines that I've already built that are, that seem to be working pretty well. Um, but, but we're going to be, I'll be playing with it all summer because I do, I do think there's a lot of possibility in what SRT is doing. I think it, 
from the folks that I've talked to, it really feels like it's about 90, 95% of what Zixi is. So um, anyway, uh, and I think that there, there are other things that we're gonna see more of in the future. Uh, we've been talking about the elemental links that use Zixi currently, but when you own both sides of the ingest, so the, 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 uh, when, you, when you're owning the contribution hardware and the receiving hardware, you can do a lot of really interesting things as far as um, you know, how you design communication between those. Uh, anyway, go ahead, uh, Phil, next question. Very uh, popular question here about whether Blackmagic is gonna ever support NDI. Do you have any sense of that? Blackmagic has given no indication that they're supporting NDI. <laughs> That's all I can say. The only thing that makes us interested is that the camera backs for the Ursas have an ethernet port that isn't being used right now. So, you know, so we're kind of like, hmm, that looks interesting. But, but there has been no, uh, no talk by Blackmagic about what they're, what they're supporting or, or when they would support it. Um, and uh, we all hope that they would pick up on the IP area. We, the, the other thing a lot of us are wondering is why we haven't seen new routers that are bigger. So we wonder whether, Apple, uh, whether, whether Blackmagic is not investing in those for certain reasons. And so we're trying to, trying to figure that out. But we don't, we don't have a solution yet. And we don't right. know. Jeff I don't think Francis anybody knows. Ask, sorry? I don't think anybody knows. Yeah. Uh, Jeff brand. Francis asking, um, which video conferencing systems allow live ISO audio outputs or ISO video, and I can strip the audio? The only one that I know of is Teams and Skype. You know, I think that the Teams and Skype are the only ones that are doing, that are as a video platform allowing for ISO uh, outs. And I don't know if Skype, does Skype do multiple? Like if you have four people, will it send all four of them out? Is, is this, no, um, even the that. even the um, NDI streams, video streams, um, come out with mixed audio. Right. Yeah. So, but I but I believe that Skype and Skype and Teams are the only ones that are going to give you ISO outs. You know, for um, you know, for that record. Uh, I don't think that any other any of the other ones are supporting that currently. It's been definitely something that we brought up with. But it most... says that. But Skype says that it uh, records separate audio file for each participant. Is that something different? I want it live, not recorded. No, yeah, I think that the, the I believe oh. that te Teams was talking about doing that, all, and that was announced at, at Build, I believe, um, or you know, for Microsoft. And um, so I don't know if it's currently doing that. I thought that Skype already did multiple video outs, but I'm not I'm not certain because I haven't I haven't t tested it myself. So oh, live, I don't know if anyone live. knows. Yeah, live okay. live output. Yeah, but Sorry. Teams and Teams and Skype are the are the direction currently for for that type of thing. We do it by having every person. Uh, connect to us separately, <laughs> to a separate box, and then we record them, and then we have to do all the basically what these what Zoom does. We do in hardware so that we can record those those ISOs uh, directly, and we have a lot more control that way. So, what's the so those advantage are, of that? What's the advantage of that? Well, uh, the advantage of doing one. well, the the main thing is is that a I have a lot more control over comms. You know, so I have you know I have a lot more in comms. I have redundancy. So if one person has an issue. It's much easier for me to deal with that one person if I ha if they're on a completely separate pipeline. It's okay. not that you can't deal with it in other ways, but really, like I've had issues where I have a contributor that's broke that their video is breaking up. I need to restart their connection and figure it out. I can have someone just go to that computer and talk to them, restart their connection while the live show is still going, and it's and it's just easy. It's not them jumping into into my system in any way. It's completely isolated. Uh, and so it's really like when you start doing these kind of hardware solutions, you end up being able to um, isolate problems uh, in real time uh, and, and very effectively get to the end of them. Uh, it also means that we have, uh, you know, again, I now have a lot of control over their graphics. I'm cutting them the way I want to. I can do four ups, you know, uh, you know, so I can do all the things you'd see in broadcast with each person. And you could do some of that stuff with the, you know, with vMix or, or TriCaster, you know, some of those things that will allow for those or, or Wirecast or Memo Live. But it's just harder when it's all inside of one application to isolate issues. Um, and so what we find is it, by separating it into one machine, the new system we're building right now, we've, we're not going to be using Skype for much longer um, unless it's an emergency uh, because of the, it's hard to get people to, nobody uses Skype anymore. So it's, you have to get them to install it. You have to get them to learn how to use it. You have to figure out how you're going to find them. You literally can't connect to them you know, half the time. Like we always have one person that takes an hour to connect to on Skype and it's just, it's just completely foobar. So, so anyway, the, um, uh, 
So we're going to get rid of Skype is the highest quality video in our opinion, but we're going to get probably dump it anyway and uh, move to vMix as a solution um, for the for. But we're going to get one machine per vMix, <laughs> so so that we still have it isolated. So there'll be you know five PCs that 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 have vMix on them, each one providing a call with the ability to add two calls if we wanted to. And so we're getting like I think the seven hundred dollar vMix for each one of them um, to build that system out, and that's going to give us a lot of other controls because now we have a full so switcher supporting that return return signal. So Go every ahead. one of them is a, is a separate input inside of vMix or? Well, the funny thing is that they have a whole source. bunch of vMixes that are managing the calls and those are all sources to an ATEM constellation. Source. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's the heavy iron version. <laughs> you know, it's not the Grass Valley version. That'd be the, that'd be the giant iron version, but, but it's a pretty heavy, heavy, uh, heavy investment into that process. And in that process, we could probably add up to 20 people without, you know, with, if, with hardware. You know, so um, anyway, uh, next next question. Yeah, Dave Edwards asking, uh, what do you use for your live streaming audio standard EBU 128, AES 17, et cetera? Um, we're not streaming audio directly, I mean, on its own. Um, typically, in most of our streams, we're using some, ver some variant of AAC as part of the, <clears throat> as part of the streaming, as part of the video codec. Anyone else doing anything different than that? That's pretty much the, so it's, it's not really, um, uh, but we're not doing, I, we are considering live audio streaming. I'm, I'm looking at trying to stream this live, this, this conversation live so that people can, can listen to it. Um, and that hopefully by July, by sometime in July, we'll have it streaming and then I'll have, I'll have more opinions, you know, about live streaming, um, audio but i but we're still researching it because i haven't the only time i've had to do it is do we've had encoders that could do contribution to sirius or or to xm or you know that that kind of thing where we send it to them or iHeartRadio, where we just you know they give us the the codec that they want and we we patch it in next question yeah robert baker said he uh lost some equipment due to a storm what do you guys use for surge protections and overall equipment protection I recommended the uh, Leviton uh, 5120, which is a panel that goes on your uh, service entrance, electrical service entrance. It protects the whole house. It's $100 and change. And I should have put mine in a long time ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, you know, I had a tree take out, take out my power line and watch the light show out my window and never did anything about it. But luckily, nothing got hurt. You got a link for that? Yeah, it's in the chat. Uh, Leland, can you show that? Do you see it? Um, yeah, there's, there's the APC, uh, Chris Summers is showing APC surge protection. Um, the, you know, the, I try to not use, I, well, I try to get as dumb a, um, power supply as possible because I, I don't want it to, t <laughs> to think for me. Uh, we've had ones turn off on, on me and what we use a lot are UPSs that have surge protection in them. Uh, one thing to think about is, um, what, and Marty, what, what UPS is that we're, what we're using in the van? I can't remember the name of the, the brand name. Um, in, in the, the trailer, trailer, we had well, you're, you're, We didn't. Did we test you before we started? You're, yeah, you're he was bouncing between two mics. Turn oh, one of them off, Marty. Oh, uh, oh, you're right. There we go. Is that better? That's much better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, we had Liebert uh, UPSs in the in the trailer, and they were special because they were online. So the power coming out of them is always being generated by the inverter in the UPS. That's inline. That's inline, yes. So that they were they were always generating and so you were always getting clean power. And I did that because the trailer would get run on generators a lot and I didn't know where the generator was coming from. Some generators, the new ones, if they have a fault, they just drop their output. I have, however, been on a film set when the generator failed and it winds down so the 60 hertz goes away and it gets this really weird signal coming out that just eats electronics and that happened when the gaffer was asking why i always ran on shore power instead of their generator and i said well because i don't really trust the generators they wind down sometimes and when they wind down they blow up my equipment yep hey why yep. is it dark <clears throat> Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, so the inline, you know, the, the, that is like for, from our production perspective, that's kind of the high watermark of making sure that, 
your equipment, especially if you're spending a lot of money on equipment, is getting clean power all the time. You're powering the battery, and then the battery is powering everything else. Uh, you're not ever letting that. It's not like an AP, APC that is switching over when it to, to battery when it when it loses power. This is always going from the batteries, and so so I think that that is the um, you know kind of the high watermark of of making that work. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that, that'd be the thing that I would think about. I mean, we use them for the, our, our little trailer, the, uh, we still used a lot of APCs for on site, but we, everything on site when we, when we load in is on, on UPSs, you know, and, and we split it up so that the UPSs are generally 40 to 60% capacity, um, so that we have room for surges and everything else. And it's when everything's running. So we turn the elementals on, we get them running, we get everything doing what it's supposed to be doing before we do that. Remember that you don't need to put all your laptops on it. They burn up, they, they, pull, they do a lot of pull and they have batteries. So they have their own UPS. And so you don't, you know, so you have to think about that, that power consumption across the UPSs. Um, but UPSs and power, uh, you know, but protecting, you know, in, in Africa, you're con we're constantly, we don't have the money to put those, the, those kinds of uh, UPSs in. And we've, you just slowly whittle away all your hardware, <laughs> you know, so it just slowly, it just slowly dies, uh, you know, like it, it, we, uh, you know, you know, just slowly just kind of dies a, a painful, a, 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 not a super painful, but somewhat semi painful death. Uh, so power is a big, big, big issue. Mickey, go ahead. And then you're shy. Yeah, a Libra that uh, Marty mentioned is, is really good, but they're quite priced for the big boys in general. Um, what I use are Furman products, and each each of my equipment racks has a uh, Furman. Also, yep. when you order them, make sure you look at um, what frequency and voltage they use based on where you're, where you live. Yeah, yeah. It, it, if you plug, if you go the wrong direction um, and plug, especially one ten, uh, a one ten connection into a two forty, it, it gets pretty exciting pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, surge protectors don't don't really have um, switching capability. Yeah, it, it it smells bad, <laughs> and sometimes you actually get sparks coming out of the, out of the, uh, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, you shine. Yeah, uh, the the Libert is is actually industry standard, especially in data centers. So on the high, on the big uh, UPSs, they are pretty much the standard. However, on the small one, the APC became very good in the last few years, and some of them even more reliable than the small Libert. One more thing to pay attention to is to match the amperage coming out of the wall to the UPS. So if you have 20 amp, you want to make to match it so you, you squeeze as much as you, you can out of the outlet. If the outlet is 15, don't buy over buy UPS, match it to the 15 amp and you can save yourself a lot of money there. Really good point. They're actually both made, I just want to make a point, Nationwide Power are the creators of Vertiv, Emerson, Lieber, and APC. So you're looking at the same manufacturing process, it's just the higher end equipment. And I like to, the last thing I'll say is that I really like to buy UPSs that I can, um, that I can change the batteries. So you can get, the, when you start buying little ones, you, you don't get to a point where you can swap those batteries. But as you start to get to like the 1500 uh, KVAs, uh, you can start swapping those batteries. And um, sometimes you need to be able to do that if you're going to fly with them is to, uh, you know, and you have to put in a lot of, a lot of slips and things and explain it. You have to flip the batteries before you ship them. You know those types of things. So I just want to one more thing regarding UPS. Point. Don't even don't even bother with a, a UPS that doesn't allow you to change batteries. I just want to add one more UPS. Uh, one more uh, point on the UPS. You have to know that usually they allow cycle of three time changing the battery. Then you have to actually dump the whole UPS. So this is another thing to know. So that's, after three yeah. time, if you call them, they tell you, you have to change the UPS. That, that's a manufacturer recommendation. I yes. I've, Yes. Not found that to be an actual problem. They just do that for liability. When, when your data is online, I think you want to <laughs> you want to listen to. All that. right, all right. Next next question. Next question. Scott Favorite is asking about closed captioning resources. Best practices seems to always be problematic. It really is always problematic. Um, anyway, so uh, you know, I think the hard part we have is that there are so many different ways that everybody ingests um, the the closed captioning, and so. Uh, the, the thing that, that I tend to lean towards is wanting to use a 608, 708 insertion into an SDI signal, just because it means that I can get it to a lot of different, everything, most of the things that I, that I work with will read the bank data. So there's a small data, data path on, on, on the SDI that is uh, usually, you know, it's, that's what it's used for is this, this, this extra line 21 has got all this extra data that, that's going through it. 
And the problem is you go through a switcher, you'll lose all of it because things like black magic use it to shade their cameras. And, but lots of switchers will strip off your bank data as it goes through. So usually your encoder, and in this case, this is the caption encoder. The most popular one in the industry is the EEG 491 and 492 are probably, you know, 80% of the market. Um, and, uh, and so you use, we use those to encode the captioning into it. Now there's a couple different ways that that happened. Um, they have, uh, EEG is moving towards AI. So there's an AI solution that it can literally send the audio out from the EEG and, and get captions back from a, uh, from an AI solution. Um, you also have, uh, what's called ICAP, which is the EEG sends it out and, um, a captioner is literally getting the audio stream from the EEG and typing, and they're connected to it and sending back the caption. And the captioning, a person captioning, is someone sitting in front of a stenography, you know, hardware and typing away cor chords that that say that put out words. And it's kind of an amazing thing to watch in person. Um, and then, uh, anyway, so those are you know some of the ways. And then, of course, you can have the the captioners that are on site. For the largest events we do, we bring the captioners on site um, so that they're so that they can see the rehearsals and do all the other things that they need to do. Um, there is another way for YouTube to do this and some other solutions, which is that they will, um, YouTube has an HTTP input instead of just the 608. In fact, it, for a long time, that's all YouTube had. And so you give a, you, you basically send a, a URL string to a, uh, to your captioner and they can sit there and, and push it, you know, push it directly into YouTube as a separate piece. The cool thing about that is that A, it's much easier to change captioners. Um, and B, you know, because they can just, one can stop and the other one can start and it's, um, and it just starts right up, you know, between the, the HTTP without any kind of, uh, hardware connection. Um, number two, the, the danger is, is that if one captioner leaves your job and then starts another job somewhere else and doesn't take that, that link out, you'll have two cap sets of captions going in at the same time. So it just turns into garbly gook. Um, we once had that happen anyway. So, um. So anyway, so those, that's some of the dangers there. Uh, that's using things like stream text will we'll relay that, but um, the, the hardware that, uh, the software, whether it's ProCap or Eclipse, both have the ability to both send to an EEG as well as send to an HTTP at the same time. And they usually have two outputs on the, in the software. Um, the, you know, the real challenge is, is the hard part with captioning is to just know that it's not always accurate, especially in tech areas. Um, where they're, you know, where you have to come up with new words that, that people haven't seen before. So if if your captioners don't have time to um, build up their library and and rehearse with you, you're going to have trouble. A lot of people try to save money by not having the captioners um, rehearse, and that's usually a really problematic issue. Uh, so you really want to make sure that that is uh, um, that people you can kind of jump into that. Bill, you were going to say something. Yeah, that the things are changing a little bit out there, particularly for all the editors. Uh, they're starting to build captioning capabilities that are kind of automatic into a lot of the nonlinear editing suites. Um, I happen to use Final Cut 10, and it has a bunch of workflow extensions where you can literally take your audio, send it up to the cloud. It'll caption, it'll translate the audio into closed captions and send you back an XML file that you can put into your editor. Um, the deal well, and is- I, and, I, and I would to, to say, I mean, I use Simon Says for a lot of that. And um, and Simon Says, is it Simon Says.ai? Is that right? Simon Says.ai. Yeah. You can literally install it into Final Cut and you can, in your project, you get your project edited, you can just send it to Simon Says um, and it'll come back in 20 minutes or whatever. And it will, and it's, it's really accurate. I mean, the live captioning isn't quite as accurate, but the, but the, um, and, and what's really cool about it is it's timed really well. When you, when you get a live caption file, a VTT file from your event, it's all over the place and you have to oftentimes retime things and everything else. But the, um, but the stuff that comes back from Simon Says is locked in. To make it even more interesting is you can send that script to the Simon Says script to your client. They can cut down what they want and it'll come back and, uh, edit it for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is a really cool system. The other thing, though, is that when you have AI do your translations, you always have to proofread. So people think, oh, I'll just run this through and then send it out to the public. Don't do that. Uh, if you don't proofread carefully, it is going to make, you know, how can it tell there, there, and there, three forms of the same word that sound exactly the same? It's going to have errors like that. Also, it will do language translations, but it's the same issue. If you're going to translate into another language, you've got to find somebody who can proof that language and no one will ever agree so you know in translations it doesn't matter who it is 
even if you have an expert doing the the, the translation, um, no one's ever going to agree that they said they used the right word for the right thing. That's just the way the way it is. And you have to kind of be pretty thick skin about that and talk to clients about it and manage expectations because it's just not going to work, you know. And um, but what I will say is that right now, the the leader in captioning for editing. So I was talking a little bit about the live pipeline, but I would say that Final Cut is by far the leader. If you're doing captioning work, the the the, the Final Cut pipeline is unbelievable like they it went from so easy and, and well, they, it, what it does they, is it gets you compliant because the ada is supposed to require all broadcast stuff to be captioned so if you can do that in five minutes for your clients well, they love you the big thing is is that the fine tuning of it it just comes in as little layers and you can sit there and retime it and change it i have to go through for big events i have to bring it into final cut and i'll sit there and i'll bring the raw data in and then clean it all up inside of final cut and it, there's nowhere faster i used to use mac captions for it and, you know, I still use Mac captions to do some conversions, you know, to, to move through it, um, which is why I still have a computer that's on that's not uh, hasn't been updated because Mac captions. I don't know if Mac captions has gotten to 64 bit yet, but uh, it is. Um, uh, but Final Cut right now, as far as editing captions, there's nothing, nothing even close at the moment on the Mac, at least. I don't know about the PC. Uh, go ahead, Alex. And also for um, Final Cut and also I think other apps or Mac apps, there's Speedscriber. Um, it's effectively the same as Simon says from a workflow point of view, but they've got a really good transcription editor and it's actually designed so you can edit the transcription. So you can select things, put full periods at the end of paragraphs and it deals with the punctuation because the thing it takes time to do is edit the transcription so that they're correct. And it's got a really good text editor that's designed for transcriptions with a different kind and, of text and, editor. And, and, and who, who, what's that one again? Can you give us the name again? That's called Speedscriber. Speedscriber. Speed I put the and link. that's Mac oh, and PC. Oh. Um, I don't know. I I put it a link in the uh, in in the chat. Okay, great. Uh, also, let's go on to the next question. We've hammered that one pretty hard. Rick Combs is asking about uh, advice for upgrading his Xeon Dell, his specifically processor. Do I go to a seven or nine? And what kind of video card might he choose? Do you want to jump on that? I mean, I'll always for some say video editing. He's he's specifically looking to do some premiere for premiere premiere i mean i would i would recommend 10, 1080 or above with a 99 but what jeffrey uh well it, uh, first of all it really depend on what what um, machine i mean it's just saying you have a dell xeon that doesn't say too much is it upgradable is it uh does it have the right uh process in there that uh that can be upgraded and then still have a great video off of it because we don't know uh, the board or mm -hmm. the processor itself. If it's over five years old, chances are upgrading it's gonna help, but not that well. Uh, but if you've got something that's only a couple years old, then 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 you can definitely upgrade it. So, uh, age of machine is is a big factor on that. Yep. Next question. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Chris, before we go. Yeah, I just I, I'm reading that question as he's thinking of getting a whole new machine. I can't imagine going from Xeon processor to a he says uh, he's thinking about upgrading my older Xeon Dell. Okay. Mm. Just, but I don't know if you can go from Xeon to uh, an i-series, right? On the same motherboard? I don't think yeah, you can. That's, that yeah, Xeon should be a dual processor board if that's a workstation. So, yeah, you're looking at a whole motherboard upgrade and everything in this case. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing he's talking about getting a whole new thing. I think I, I don't use Premiere. I use uh, DaVinci Resolve. But I just saw a bunch of videos pop up. up two, three weeks ago, talking about a massive upgrade in Premiere and its access to the video cards. Is that a thing? Did anybody else see that? Because I think it's it's utilizing them much better than it used to. Yes, it is. That, that's what they've been promoting, uh, speed increases in the new version of Premiere. Absolutely. Yeah, because I love what DaVinci does with my uh, NVIDIA card. It's crazy. So I can imagine that if Premiere is you know, pumping that, it, it's probably a huge upgrade. So it will crash faster than it used to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right? All right, all right, next question. So um, how noisy are the, Na this is from TJ, the other TJ, uh, how noisy are the Nanlite 60s fans? Uh, almost, uh, I, I can barely hear them. I mean, I got other fans going on here, so I'd have to go back and put, um, I have other fans going on, but I can't hear them. Uh, any more than I heard before. So there, these are the, hold on. You posted a picture in the- I posted a picture behind it. And just so you guys see what the, let's see here, hold on. I, I turned off my 
I turned off my camera, of course. So what I have is I got um, I these four, um, let's see. Mm. So these are the, the four lights that are there that were replacing this kind of old hodgepodge of, of lights that I, that I had before. Um, and they... Uh, you had Kino 400s before, right, Alex? I had a Kina flow that was, didn't have a, I didn't have any, diff, I had like bought some cheap diffusion and had clipped it up there. And then I had two eye cans on either side. And, and it was, it was kind of a just hodgepodge of things that I could put together. Um, the, that's not what I have. I have the mix sixties up there instead of the, that's the, um, that's a different light that Jeffrey's showing. Um, these are panels. Um, and, and then I put, and then I have diffusion on them. So these are not the, yeah, not the point sources, but they're the, the panel, the panel versions, um, the mix, mix panel sixties, I think. Anyway, so, dimmable? sorry. Are they dimmable? Can you dim they them? Are. Dim the... They're are dimmable you at full color. Power now? I'm at full power at the moment. Yep. I turned them all the way up. I was able to, with the new lights, I was able to turn my, uh, I, I was able to drop one. Uh, set one jump down on, on the gain on my on my compu on my uh, black magic uh, studio so so I got more light than I had before um, I have a little more control over it it, it looks a lot cleaner <laughs> and I have a lot more control they have so they have DMX that I haven't I haven't wired up yet but I want to wire a DMX into them and so um, and they just now I have to admit I have not gotten new lights for some time so I don't know how they compare you do. someone asked I was there. Uh, these were lights that have been, we, we, that they're 10 years old or eight years old that I had up there. And, um, and so these just feel like I jumped into the future. I mean, they're, they're, uh, durable. They're, they've got great interfaces. They've got, they're actually, I guess you have to buy an extra Wi Fi thing, but there's an app that will control them. Um, and so there's a bunch of things about them. They, they seem to have, they're kind of like in the mix where they're not as, you know, obviously not as expensive as light panels. Um, but they're, they're definitely a big jump up. I was testing, like, I can't afford light panels. So what can I, you know, what's the in-between thing? And I tried Switty, which is a really cheap ones that I gave to somebody else because I was like, I'm not going to use these. <laughs> anyway, so, so, the, um, so the, that, was, that was too low. Uh, and these are kind of in the in-between. And so they're, um, I'm, I'm really happy, you know, with uh, the test so far. So um, anyway, so it's, uh, yeah, go ahead, Kyle. No, I can't. Yeah, so, go ahead. so I know we had talked about the uh, apertures kind of in the same price range. I brought up a couple of weeks ago about the fans on those maybe being a concern for small spaces. I've had zero problems. Uh, I'm yep. much more concerned about laptop fan noise at this point. Yeah, and I would say ap aperture and yeah, I definitely don't see I don't see these ones as as an, an aperture and nan light are kind of in the same the same. Uh, they're kind of competing. They're probably the two direct competitors in that price in that price point. Um, and uh, and so uh, and I think they're both really strong lights. You know, I don't I don't have a strong opinion. I think that ap Aperture does a really good job. So um, anyway, so but yeah, fans aren't too. I haven't found them to be too much. I'm, I'm just excited about getting the DMX in there and being able to control everything. So that's uh, that's something that I'm that I'm looking forward to. Next question. Guillaume asks, uh, did you do your vMix experiment weekend uh, this weekend? I promised on Saturday that I was installing vMix and, and I got the computer wired up and I had some monitor issues. And then I was like, I'm taking Sunday off. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, I, I, had, I had some issues with, with, I uh, couldn't, here's the worst part is I'm really specific about not buying monitors that don't have either a figure eight, a, a C7 or a C13 input. And this is one monitor. The one last monitor I have is one that was sitting in the garage that, that, uh, that has some weird power supply and I couldn't find the power supply. And then I just got frustrated and decided to hang out with my kids. So uh, this week I will be putting vMix on. I have to get it on the next day or two. So I'll, I will give you a report by Wednesday or Thursday about how vMix is going. But I'm, I, I feel positive about where it's going to go. Anyway, next, next question. Back on light, Steve asks, um, Steve Machaz. I, don't, I slaughtered your name. I apologize. Need a Mahaz, couple of, Mahaz. Mahaz. He correct. We, we had a okay. discussion about this on, on, on Discord. <laughs> I'll try to I'll get that. Um, asks about the Elgato key lights. Wants to do for a couple of Zoom meetings. Anybody have any ideas about those? Looks like Marty's using them. What do you think, Marty? There we go. Yeah, I've actually been doing a bunch of research into this. Um, they're cool. Uh, of course, I've taken it apart. <laughs> um, and I do like the light they put out. Um, 
I was looking for something that I could control over the network so I could remote control it so a lighting person off site could be able to adjust the lights. And unfortunately, the only way these things operate is over Wi Fi. And, uh, and that's, and that's have to have a Wi Fi network. And that's specifically one of the reasons that I'm interested in the NAND lights as far as the DMX goes, is just having DMX input and then setting up a network that yeah. I can use, that, that I can use DMX to control the lights. Now, be careful about DMX over your network because it, uh, unless you have a local DMX controller that you're speaking to with the network, a DMX thing can take over your network pretty fast. Well, it would be dedicated to it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But so it's Marty, on the website that it works with a stream deck. Has anybody tried to control it with a stream deck yet? Uh, the stream deck goes into your computer, into the uh, control center software. The control center software then goes over the Wi-Fi out to the Oh, uh, gotcha. Okay, There's no gotcha. hardwire to it. What do you mean by take over your network? Okay. I'm, I'm not sure yep. I get that. Oh, uh, it's, it's just very chatty. Yeah. 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 DMX just chats all the time. Okay. Cyp Cyprian and then Elliot. Um, I got mine last week, and they're they're really dead simple to use. Just plug them in, no worries. They just work mm -hmm. every time, so I'd recommend them. How's the noise? There's no fan, I assume. There's no noise. They're silent. Yeah, no noise. No noise. Uh, Elliot, uh, I think they're I think they're good for like an entry level thing. I've got a couple of key lights. They're really compact and bolt right to a desk. I'm giving mine to family members. Um, I'm, they don't they don't have a ton of output, so I'm I'm upgrading to apertures. Yep. Yeah, and, and that was for me that I just didn't think they were going to be for, for my personal use. I didn't think they'd be bright enough, even even with the Nanlite 60s. I I probably if I, you know, did it again, I'd probably get 150s you know, so that I could try to get my gain all the way down to zero, you know, for for lighting. Um, but but the uh, um, I think that that's the problem with a lot of the smaller lights is this they don't have enough uh, enough kick. Um, anyway, next question. We're gonna we're gonna move 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 okay. a little. We're now moving into the speed round because we're running out of time. All right. George Kennedy wants to know why is Zoom recording at 25 frames a second and also 360p in the cloud and 720p? And is there any way to get 720p turned on in the cloud? Not that I know of. I don't think. And I think this is just a fact that we have to remember that that Zoom scaled 20x in one month. So they're still working on capacity. Uh, I don't know of any way to do 720 in the uh, in the cloud right currently do i think it's going to be handled sometime yeah absolutely but i don't think it's going to happen uh right now um and so and i i'm not certain that um even when it says 720p and some some version of streaming i think that it oftentimes is at 360 and somewhere in the pipeline because it's just under so much demand but i think that we'll see that start to clear up um i don't i don't know why it's set, recorded 25 uh, what i will say is that frame rate is not from a a, a standard use case for a um a standard use case for video conferencing, the frame rate, anything from 25 up would probably be considered acceptable because you're just talking back and forth. We're trying to use it for something far more than that. And so it, it, it shows up as a missing, but we're an edge case. And we still are a very, very, very small edge case in the bigger picture. So we have to understand, you know, where we sit in the food chain, <laughs> you know, in the, in, as far as priorities go. Leland? Just wanted to comment. You can check your statistics in Zoom under the settings feature. And when you do, there's a tab for video. You'll be able to see what quality your video is coming in and being sent out at. And if you have fewer viewers, like one, two, three, four people, and they're on good connections, the likelihood of you getting a 720 signal on screen for everybody is very high. But as you continue to add members, it's going to continue to lower the resolution for all the people coming into the group. So consider that. If you want to see 720, go with a couple of people and see what you get check your settings and see if it rolls might even be your internet connection that's going to slow you down as well so if you don't have enough speed zoom's never going to give you 720. uh next question yeah uh brian m's not here but the question was about seems uh tj think, seems to think he's using uh speakers instead of headphones and he wanted an explanation of how he's doing that without getting feedback or echo uh well i, I it's a good it's a good question. Generally, when you have uh, mics with a lot of off axis rejection, you can get away with open speakers without too much trouble. There's a couple different ways of doing that. One is 
you can have a complex audio pipeline that's doing some kind of auto mix, like a Dugan auto mix or, or some kind of auto mix assist that basically pushes when the speaker's going, it pushes the mic down. When the mic's going, it pushes the speaker down. And you can get away with that even with a relatively an omnidirectional mic. Um, but that is a more complicated version. The least complicated version is, is that the speaker isn't up too high and the uh, microphone is uh, a very directional mic. So a high LPR 40, or, or, or the like, um, you know, SM58s, you know, lots of, there's lots of different mics. And we're gonna talk about miking a bit tomorrow in the second hour. So we'll probably over address some of that. But the, uh, we, like on Twit, when we're doing Mac break, when we used to be in an office doing it, uh, we oftentimes had the speakers oh, pretty loud uh, on and you, you, we, what we call bleeding, you know, bleeding the remotes. And so they would just bleed, bleed into the, into the uh into the room and we didn't have any uh we didn't have any issues at all because it just a lot of these mics will drop the uh, you know if they're set up for your gain if you're close to that mic it's already gained down because you're right there and then in addition to it it doesn't really hear a lot from other directions and as a result you end up with not hearing uh really any of the return uh, it's, it really depends on the mic and the and the speaker placement go ahead joseph oh uh, yeah i was just going to say that muting when you're not talking is <laughs> if you're on a zoom Useful. call is by far the best thing you can do to avoid that Regardless of the mic you're using, just always like, being muted if, unless you have to be someone just who, who just who just showed us exactly what the what the issue was <laughs> dog was that you mike yeah sorry the dog <laughs> your, timing, yeah. Your, your, your time was impeccable okay that's why we mute <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, I, I want to tell <laughs> you that i'm, I'm on uh, no, we're, no, you're not gonna do it with the mic with the dog um all right so uh yeah and so that's mic mic placement and using definitely using mute i leave it open a lot because i'm not but anytime i have to cl clear my throat or do anything that i think is going to make any noise i'm i'm muting um oftentimes and i don't use spacebar <laughs> and i'm i'm on a speaker anyway. i hate to i say that i'm on a speaker and it does work so, oh. i mean zoom just turns the speaker off when i'm talking yeah, that's yeah. all yeah uh it, it you know it doesn't anyway so leland go ahead just the one comment about a cardioid mic has a pattern that rolls behind the mic that creates a dead spot. So if you have your speakers behind your mic and far enough away, two feet plus, then you're going to have the opportunity to speak and listen without it being picked up on the mic. But it has to be a cardioid pattern to do that. And 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 sometimes, you know, like yeah, sometimes you, you, you you're still going to get bleed. That's yeah. that's a still pretty pretty technical um, setup to to make that work. Uh, we're gonna uh, Patrick. We're gonna skip that question. If you want to put it up as a shorter question, that'd be that'd be fine. Um, Patrick Denny put up a kind of a long one there, and we'll we'll uh, move we'll move on from that. Go ahead. What's the next question? Yeah, Tim K is asking a question. Uh, maybe a little confusion here about uh, you mentioned you push your client's live stream first to AWS and then to the CDN. Why not push it directly to the CDN? I'm not sure that. Right. So so the. Uh... What we're looking at right now is using the links. I don't do everything that way. It's, so the, 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 there's a couple of things. One is if I wanna send something to multiple CDNs at one time, um, then the idea of using, you can use restream.io, but one of the things that I'm starting to research and, and play with, and, and we've done a little bit of already, is just sending it to, to AWS and then, and then streaming it from AWS to um, the different locations that I wanna go to. If you're not doing a ton of it, if you're doing a couple shows a week that are an hour long, it's probably cheaper to go to AWS than to pay 200 bucks a month to restream. You know, so you just if, if you're using it depends on how much if you're using it every day, then restream is probably cheaper. So you just have to make a decision about what how much it costs. AWS costs you between 60 cents and a dollar a minute. I'm sorry, an hour, <laughs> not a minute. 60 cents to a dollar an hour to stream to each CDN. So if you're going out to five CDNs, it's costing you, let's just say five bucks an hour to do that. So if you're doing, you know, um, you could do 40 hours of streaming over AWS before you hit the same cost. Now, this is a little bit more of a roll your own. You're saving money, but you uh, you now have to, um, you're theoretically saving money, but you are rolling your own. You're learning a little bit more about AWS. Restream is really easy. You just kind of drop down and do whatever you want to do. Um, I uh, so, so I think that, um, you know, what I'm looking at is having a path more and more of a path into the cloud. And then I redirect all the things that I want from those. If you're only connecting to one CDN, just stream to one CDN. You know, like you don't, you know, if you're just going to Facebook, there's no reason not to just go to Facebook or, or to YouTube or whatever. It's it, the, the AWS solution is more of a, I want to reroute it. Now, the other thing that I'm looking at is, you know, with more and more folks that we're talking about, we're talking about sending the elemental links, you know, out to someone and say, I don't need you to know anything about streaming. Just plug this in, power it, you know, plug it in and power it and you're off to the races. And so that's the, 
um, the other side of that is that that's always going to go to AWS. But I also don't, I can send this tiny little box out and the client doesn't need to know anything about it other than that they plug the ethernet in and they plug the power in and it goes into the cloud. <laughs> you know? So, and I, and I run it and I control it and everything else on the way in. So that's another piece of that. Uh, and there's a couple Streambox and a couple other folks that do the, a similar thing. Um, so there's, there, the, AWS is definitely not the only one, but it's a relatively inexpensive solution. And, and it's, you, you know, using Zixi in the backhaul. And so I'm, you know, or in, the, or in the mezzanine connection, which I'm pretty happy with. So, so anyway, that's the, uh, yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, how much is the, the hardware for AWS? It's a thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. And what about yours? That's semi-translucent. Uh, yeah, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. See this one, the one that I have here, it's, it's actually, it's already in the cloud. So it's a cloud <laughs> encoder that's already in the cloud. So it's, it's semi-transparent. Now I have a, um, uh, my key, uh, <laughs> my, my, my key is a, um, uh, uh, is overriding this. So anyway, that's, it never gets uh, old. Yeah. Um, next, next question. Yeah. Uh, Mitchell's is asking about for your m movie viewing and non work media viewing, what kind of monitor do you like size resolution screen, that sort of stuff? Well, I think we can all talk about this. I mean, I, for me, you know, I wanted to, I, my, my kind of rule of thumb is that I'm not spending a ton of money on, on TVs cause I keep on buying new ones. And so I don't, I don't go crazy. Um, I usually get a 70, I find that the price performance 70 inches is kind of the place where I start, you know, I, I like it to be at least 70 inches. Once you go to 80 inches, it gets really expensive or at least it seems to, that's where the break off is. So 70 inches, 4k, I want it to su support Dolby vision. Um, you know, uh, as, as far as the HDR goes. And um, I don't really care about any of the software in it because I don't, I won't let my TVs talk to the internet. And so everything goes through my Apple TV. Um, and so I don't, uh, you know, I just don't, I don't trust them. <laughs> you know, so I don't trust the, the TVs. So, so they're, they're, they're not allowed to touch the ethernet cable. They just get- what, What's your HDMI. viewing distance? What, what do you like to sit back? My family's viewing distance tends to be about, um, I would say about six to eight feet maybe maybe up to 10 feet away we, we, we have a we have a surround the, the surround sound system kind of uh defines the, <laughs> the where we sit so it's it's there's a set place that the that the couch is and and the uh and so it's it's set i think at about i don't know exactly what it is but i think it's six to eight feet from the from the from the tv uh bill go ahead I've been shocked at my personal transition from watching TV, which we, my wife and I used to do a good bit, to more and more personal devices. I find I'm tending to watch more content on phones and iPads now by a huge factor. So that's just informing how much I'm going to invest in future big TV things. We'll probably always have one, but it's just getting used less and less. I like, I like, I mean, once you, if you have a surround, the thing that I've noticed is if you have surround sound in a 4k TV with, with HDR, you really don't feel the need to go to the theater very often. Like that's the big thing is that the technology has gotten to a point where, you know, I don't, I don't feel like the only place that I, that's better than my house um, to watch TV is uh, the Dolby cinemas. You know, so I'll go to see a movie. I kind of watch to see what movies are showing up in Dolby Cinema, or I used to now when we could go to the theaters. But I, I would always just watch what's on Dolby Cinema. And if it crossed over, like a movie I want to see is in the Dolby Cinema, there's only one in the Bay Area. Uh, then I would go down and I actually will only sit in, I think it's, I believe it's, I have to go back and look at my notes, but I think it's uh, seats 10E and 10F are the only two seats in the in the theater that I'll sit in because they have no row before in front of them. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the one where they is right before the break and it's right in the center of the of the theater. And it's a it's a great viewing experience right from those. It's not worth paying for otherwise. Uh, Chris and then Leland. Yeah. So I stopped watching TV like back in 2004 and oh, I different did, Chris. <laughs> and oh, oh, go sorry, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, that's why everything it's on on the computer. So I run two of the Dell 43 inch uh, displays mm -hmm. and you know i usually got youtube up on one or itunes on another one but yeah the tv doesn't even yep. come into the play anymore yep chris summers i'll be yeah go ahead chris oh, chris, chris summers and then and then leland and we're Sorry. gonna go really fast go ahead chris. just to, just just a thing with the uh, I, I do the similar thing to you alex where i run everything off the apple tv and try not to plug my smart tv into the internet but the problem is with uh youtube the 4K videos you can only view like natively on the television. The huge, you know, you can't stream 4K 
through YouTube from the Apple TV for some reason. I guess I guess I have very low oh. expectation of YouTube. I, I never worried about YouTube being higher than 1080p. But but uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, but that's good. That's a good point, Leland. Uh, just just a quick experiment for everyone. Take your 1080 phone, hold it at arm's length, and stand about 10, 12 feet away from your 78 inch television set, and see if you can really tell the difference. But then you have to because hold it up. At, at range, well, yeah, or get a stand on a table. But at range, you're going to find that the size and quality of the image you get in a small device isn't really that much different than stepping away further from a large device. Yeah. Uh, okay, next next question. Kevin Murphy wants to know where he should start uh, learning DMX. We'll do it. That's an extra hour. So let's someone someone put that in the second hour, and we'll we'll bring some folks on and talk about DMX. So that's where we're going to start, and we'll start that soon because that's a really good juicy thing that I'm dealing with right now. So um, so we'll let let's put that in the second hour, and then we'll go back to that next question. Uh, Prima Kadir asks: Would Wirecast Go be good for a virtual event where participants are using mobile devices, or are there any alternatives you suggest? I don't quite understand the. If you've got Wirecast, Wirecast Go is good. If you it's don't, a small it's app. not worth it. It's, it's, um, you know, it, it it's not worth the investment if you if you're if you can do the same thing with OBS, which you can in various ways. It depends how how remote you're talking. Are you talking about portable cameras? Or are you talking about on on the same site? Or are you talking about uh, multiple remote sites? Okay. Yeah. Let's let's uh, and maybe we will ask. Um, maybe we'll talk to Jeff. Oh, Jeffrey, go ahead. I was going to say we'll, we'll ask Jeffrey to talk about it a little bit. Well, the one advantage to Wirecast Go is you can layer things. So if you have, like, let's say you have a roaming reporter and he wants to put a lower third or a website or something like that on that, you can definitely do that. You can also switch between cameras. If they're just looking for something to do, like uh, like a wedding or or live concert where they're going to patch into somebody's phone the better thing to do would just be uh, uh have them download and install and they got iphones of course download and install the ndi software and then connect via ndi because that would make it a ton so, easier yeah prima than prima to, says than it's multiple learning. remote sites multiple remote sites oh for remote sites uh yeah and that, 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 that gets is, even tougher ahead. because uh it, it it works but it's you know it's it is what it is <laughs> okay. You're, you're, effectively, so. you're effectively emulating uh, uh, Wirecast uh, uh, rendezvous. Not was that rendezvous. What, what do they call that? But it's a yeah, it's rendezvous. Rendezvous. Yeah. So this uh, this will this will feed into Wirecast at like like or more, more probably maybe can, a more stable connection. Yes, but you could do the same thing with Skype and NDI. There are any number of solutions that will that will achieve that objective. Arguably, okay, but, yeah, Skype, this was, Skype through this, NDI might be a better solution if you've got the hardware to support that on the on the production side. Yeah, this was mostly created as a one-off iOS app for Wirecast to be a more reduced framework, uh, something that you could play with on your phone and actually create a broadcast with. So that was its original. But theoretically, but theoretically, it can, you can create that broadcast, but then it can send it back to Wirecast yeah. to reproduce. Okay, yeah, yeah, it, it works with it, RTMP it as well. Yep. It'd be a fun, a fun little test um, to to kind of play with and see see how far we could take that. So we'll let's put that in the hopper of things to think about. Um, I'm kind of interested in how it, how well it works. Um, next question. We got Steve only Mahaz, a couple minutes. Yes, ask about a universal way to mute via hardware that is reliable. Trying to avoid remembering mute sh shortcut keys. And just my two cents here. I know you don't like hardware key mutes, but I've got a. I, I'm really impressed. I used um, Stream Deck through um, Keyboard Maestro on a Mac. Really dead on, and even in the background, because Keyboard Maestro is controlling it, it'll happen no matter what app I'm in. Great, yeah, because we, um, yeah, the the hard hardware is a cough is a cough switch, <laughs> so you can have cough switches that that uh, that you just push a button down, and you can either lock it in or lock it out. You know, push down and cough, or you can have ones that, and those are like actual closures, um, and so um, so that's another another path to. We and the reason I push against there's there's one that Marty Brennis is showing one that's a cop that's a mic mute. You can those you can have foot switches, you can have hand switches, you can have ones that lock in and lock out. Um, oh, that's so cool. if you're really looking for an absolute uh, control, uh, those are those are options. I, I think that for the most part, a lot of these work. I think that the problem is on any given day, we have people here who are having issues with mute, and almost all of them are connected to some kind of keyboard shortcut, something or other. And so I, I have a tendency to look sideways at it because. 
there's people that are opening their mics all the time. And I know that it's because they're doing something fancy. And I just, you know, and so, um, you know, they're, they're coming open all the time when they're, when they're not talking. And I know that there's something fancy in that pipeline that's having it, that's, that's doing that. So I tend to be unfancy. Um, uh, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I think the hardware mutes are a great idea if you're really consistent and can use them. The problem is, is that in Zoom, the host has the ability to mute you and unmute you and actually see your Zoom mute. So if you leave your Zoom mute unmuted all the time because you're using a hardware mute, then you've disabled that ability to the host. I don't think the host can unmute anymore. Is that true? You can ask to unmute. That's all. You don't actually unmute. Yeah. They said they're yeah, bringing I mean, it back in the next version. Yeah, the, um, I wish that, that Zoom would just put a red outline against everybody that's unmuted. And I also wish that I could click on a handful of people and say, unmute everybody, unmute everybody else. Like just, just thump everybody, you know, because it's, it's, it's this constant issue of trying to, especially once you get over 25 people, it's this constant chasing, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and the, like the, the little mute image is not big enough. So it's really hard to, uh, to ascertain what, what's actually happening. The only issue with privacy there is if somebody muted themselves on zoom to have a private conversation, whether a business or personal and you, and the host has the, the yeah, ability to unmute, they, can't, they should they never. Can't. Well, he just mentioned it may come back. It should never come back. They still have to accept it. It's not forced. They still have to accept it. Yeah. And that's why Hangouts was forever and drove us absolutely crazy. You know, like, I guess for me, I just want a pro version of, of Zoom that just says I can do whatever I need to do to, to, to do a good show. And, and then everybody has to sign a release when they go into it, you know, saying this is the pro version of, of this, um, you know, and, and we're all adults. Um, you know, and, and this is how this is going to work. So there's a, there's this all, always this, this in between, between those things. So now we are, uh, shifting gears, uh, to our, uh, to our ruthless reviews. Um, like right now, somebody's open. Someone's got an open mic. Who's got an open mic. I can hear it. Dex. All right. Um, anyway, so, uh, YouTube. Um, and it's open again.